Hello everybody. As you may imagine, for somebody that does my job, I am often asked what car it is that people should buy next. But here's a little secret for you. It is never about what they want. It is in fact all about what they don't want. Because people will always be happy to have a little something more that they didn't expect, but they will never ever accept something that they said they didn't want. And what then do you recommend to the person that is on the hunt for a hot hatchback or other similar practical performance car, who has decided that though they like the idea of a GI Yaris, they don't want one because it is too small. They also don't want a Golf R because it is too obvious, nor do they want a Honda Civic Type R because it looks too leery. Once upon a time, you would have had a lot of alternatives but today, not so much. There is, however, an alternative that many of us have already forgotten. This, the third generation of Renault Sport Megane. And it just so happens, this is far, far from the one left over. It is, in fact, a brilliant car, full stop. <laughs> don't know quite what it is about this generation of the Renault Sport Megane, which I always call the third, because it is the third Renault Sport, but is based on the fourth generation of Megane, but it just never really seemed to achieve the same success, perhaps notoriety, as its forebears. The first generation you'll remember for its rather distinctive looks, the big bum out the back, and that gave us the likes of the R26. The second generation then, which I think is by far the shapeliest of them all, the RS250 and 265, that is a pretty cool car and a darling of the track day scene. Yet, the third generation, despite the fact that underneath it's pretty special, just didn't seem to attract anywhere near the same amount of attention. And once you've stopped and looked a little closer at the third generation car, you do have to stop and pause for a moment and ask, why didn't people love this and buy it more? That, I can't really tell you. But what I can is what Renault did to this car and the results that it had. So, yes, it's based on the fourth generation of Megane, but it features an entirely bespoke body shell. That in of itself is a pretty big deal. And sure, the suspension sounds at first fairly conventional. You have struts up the front and a torsion beam at the back, but it has fluid-filled bump stops in the car, a damper within a damper, Renault call it. The idea there, I suspect, being that they can then put on the car a set of dampers that are firmer than you'd otherwise be able to get away with without the compromises that are often associated with them. The front end also features an evolution of the Perfo Hub technology that Renault have been working on for a while. That is, I believe, similar to Ford's Revo Knuckle technology. It's a system designed to try and stop the car suffering from enormous amounts of torque steer. Then, the icing on this particular cake, Renault gifted the car with a four-wheel steer system that they dubbed Four Control. And it is absolutely unhinged. But more on that in a few minutes when I'm going to be able to show it to you in action. open the door of the car, and you're then greeted with an interior that is a big step on from its predecessors. You have a nice, clear, easy to read digital dash with different modes depending on which drive setting you're in. Then in the middle you have this nice big portrait and very neatly integrated tablet, which also has a bright and easy to read screen. It's got just about all the functions you would need in it, and mercifully Renault have still given you nice physical controls for your cabin temperature. You then, if you want to control your stereo, can do so by the, the little classic Renault stalk on the side of the wheel, which I've always hated, but it does at least work. For those that are a fan of customising cars, it gives you an awful lot of options. So in the MySense mode, the individual one, you can configure the powertrain, the four-wheel steer system, the throttle, the sound, and the exhaust, the ESC, you can even change the cluster, the interior lighting, and the climate control mode. Plenty for somebody to play about with, but I'm going to leave Lindsay's settings as they are. I will admit that in this black on black, it's not exactly the most alluring thing. 
in other brighter shades i think it's a far sexier affair and inside you know what though it's not amazing it's still certainly more than good enough one complaint that lindsay does have is visibility in the car and i can see why the a pillar is fairly chunky b pillar very big and intrusive it does have a rear view camera but it's weirdly low resolution and kind of crap compared to all of the other stuff in here which is nice modern and sharp it does also feel like a relatively wide thing for a hot hatch not intimidating but certainly a big step up over a clio or the like however to place it not impossible you've got a little bit of a view of that front these seats are really nice, very comfortable, very supportive. My only real criticism of the interior is that it's all a bit bland. I appreciate the effort with the red stitching and the carbon and the accent lighting, but it just doesn't add up to enough for me. In terms of space, the car has just about enough room for four adults, though it isn't what I'd call overly generous. The boot, though, is quite a good size. And so, for a nice but still exciting family car, this ticks a lot of the boxes. And that's actually the major reason that its owner, Lindsay, got it. Because before this, she had a Ford Fiesta, a very faithful companion that she had driven for 17 years. But the arrival of a little one meant that it was no longer large enough for her requirements, and she wanted a five-door hatch that would suit but also had a bit more poke. She considered a Golf R, but did think that it was a little bit too obvious. And so when she examined one of these, she thought actually this was the car for her. Though she did make a somewhat controversial choice in that she actively sought out a car with the automatic gearbox. Up until 2021, you could have had these with either a manual or an auto, but when they revised the range, the manual was retired, as it was in many other cars. And I'm particularly grateful to her for coming out. She's actually been joined today by her partner, Alex, whose Ford Racing Puma I have previously featured and whose TVR Segura I've been driving this morning. In case you're not sure what on earth one of those is, you are both forgiven. And if you want to find out more, check out that video when it comes out. And if you aren't familiar with Renault Sports, the lineup can be a little confusing to decipher. So there was originally at the bottom the Renault Sport Megane 280. Then you had the 280 Cup, which is effectively the same thing, but a little more hardcore. So stiffer suspension and a proper limited slip differential in place of the electronic brake operated one that the regular car had. Beyond that, you then had the 300 Trophy, which had, of course, a little bit more power and was even more aggressively set up. And finally, there was the Trophy R, the super hardcore and rather nuts one that you might remember for actually having the option of carbon wheels and carbon brakes. Nuts on a little hot hatchback, but it did let it go around the ring rather quickly, in spite of the fact it actually did without the four-wheel steer system, binned, I believe, to save weight. When the range was revised in 2021, it was then simplified a little bit. So the 280 was dropped entirely and you were left with just the regular car and the trophy. The former then being dubbed the 300 Sport. And that's what I'm driving today. And although you might think 300 horsepower is more than enough, I do actually think that engine might be part of the reason why a lot of people just didn't pay any attention to this. And that is because where all of its contemporaries had a two litre of some flavour, this makes do with a 1.8. And I believe that might have something to do with tax restrictions in its home market. It is effectively the same engine as you would find in the Alpine A110. And the fact is, it's really very good certainly makes the numbers here you have 300 horsepower and 310 pounds feet of torque that's 420 newton meters the car weighs some 1460 kilos so though not exactly a flyweight in the real world it is still more than adequate and it just so happens we are now at that nice beautiful little ribbon of tarmac where i can show you exactly what this car is all about Ooh. 
It's been a number of years now since I last got to drive one of these, but it didn't take very long for me to be reminded why exactly it is that I loved it so much the first time around. And the number one reason I get on with this car, it's the steering. Though it isn't the most communicative or the lightest or the most subtle, it does still talk to you. It is wonderful. It's direct, the car is darty, responsive, and it gives you massive confidence. You leave the car in normal, ordinary mode, which confusingly is actually the customizable individual one, and here it's set to nearly everything normal, and it's great. You could have a really good time. Now that engine isn't the star of the show, but neither does it really ruin proceedings. Yes, there's a little bit of turbo lag, but it's also fairly strong, more or less throughout the rev range, although it just doesn't really have much interest in running for the red line. You start to pile on the speed, and at about 40 or 50, the suspension really starts to work, and this is a car you can really, really enjoy. But if you want to experience what this generation of Renault Sport Megane is really all about, you need to press this little button down here, and you need to put it in sport, or even race, as I am now. And that does a few different things. First off, it changes the screen here for the driver, makes it a little more business. Secondly, it gives you some pops and bangs out of the exhaust, which I don't hate too much because you can turn them off. It has also partly disengaged the traction control. And it has also changed the parameters of the four wheel steer. So this system works exactly the same as just about all others you've ever heard of. At low speeds, the rear wheels will turn against the front to make the car feel as if it's got a shorter wheelbase, make it a little more agile. Then, at higher speeds, it will turn in phase, making the car feel like it's got a longer wheelbase and more stable. Now, in just about every single one of these systems, the crossover between those two states is usually between sort of 15 and 30 mile an hour. And here, in normal mode, it is at about 30 mile an hour where it changes from going against to with you. But put it into sport mode, and those rear wheels will then turn against you at speeds of up to 62 mile an hour. Yeah, watch. The first time you experience it, it is nothing short of massively disconcerting, because it does feel a bit like the rear suspension has broken, and that that half of the car has now got a mind all of its own. Begin to build faith in it though, work with it and trust it, and you'll find that this is now a car that has an attitude unlike just about any other I've ever experienced. Now it's been a very long time since I drove a manual one of these, so I'm struggling really to remember what it was like, but I do know that Lindsay did try it and said that she didn't like it at all. And this auto box, actually, it's pretty good. If I have one complaint, it's the fact that the paddles are quite small and also quite far away, so you've really got to stretch to get to the damn things. But once you've actually reached the damn things and you've asked for a gear change, it will be delivered willingly and with a little bit of verve too, certainly in the sportier modes. This chassis also, for me, is set up really, really nicely for the road. It's actually very, very comfortable indeed. To carry speed in this thing, it's really, really easy. If I do have a gripe, it's the fact that, in certain situations, you can feel that front faux differential working, and it just doesn't work that well. A real proper limited slip diff here would go, I think, a long, long way. In race mode, I think it's actually intervening a little bit less, because I'm not feeling it as much as I was when I had the car in normal. <laughs> it's in bends like that, where that rear steer comes into play, and for a moment you forget that it's there, and you think, what on earth is happening? And then you go, oh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> oh, it's cracking this. Absolutely awesome. Even better, I was over at Beanie Sport the other day, a well-known specialist for rebuilding engines in the old Clios and Megans. And I asked him if he had any issues with these, and he said, actually, they're pretty solid. They can go through components like tyres and brakes fairly quickly, but that's chiefly in the context of tracking the things. On the road, they're durable, and compared to the older cars, he doesn't really see their engines all that much. In fact, he has only had to rebuild the one, and he suspected that that 
was driver error. The car's even been returning reasonably sensible MPG. In the journey I've just been doing, it's done 28 to the gallon, which, considering how I've driven it, is very good. In spite of that clever front end, torque steer definitely is still present in this car. At lower speeds, put your foot down, and that front end can be a little bit lively. It's never scary, but I do really think a car such as this, with the performance capability that it has, deserves a proper limited slip differential. Tell you something, get this car into a bend and it's absolutely mad. Feels like it's drifting its way through. It's quite addictive. Brakes are pretty decent, not too heavily servoed, but still comfortable. Don't need to push the pedal too hard, but you can still modulate it. Gear shift definitely needs bigger paddles though. That's a must for me. And this is a particularly timely review because in the last few months I have had a number of people come to me saying, James, I want a hot hatch, but I don't want a GI Yaris, a Golf R or a Civic Type R. I mean, the new Civic Type R is the thick end of 50,000 quid. It's a lot of money. I haven't yet tried it, but I'm sure like its predecessor, it's brilliant. But 50,000 quid for a Honda Civic. Hey, dear, oh dear. Now, it's not as if this was ever really a bargain, but today it is quite a bit more affordable than some of its rivals. Where the GR Yaris you're still going to be paying near enough £30,000 for, an early RS280 you could pick up for twenty two grand. But if you can afford just a little bit more, for around £25,000 you're going to get yourself into an RS300 Sport. And the general consensus seems to be that actually it is a much better car all around. And the engine, by the way, isn't simply different in terms of the map. There are hardware changes too, so there are reasons to go with the 300. I wouldn't be tempted to put any more power in this than it already has. It, to me, is absolutely fine. If I wanted to do anything, it would be cosmetic. And naturally, if you are a more sporting driver, then the trophy already exists, and to me, that makes a more logical starting point. And prices for those are more or less at the same sort of level. Not everybody wants the trophy and so they don't always command the premium that you expect they might. Likewise, I know there are plenty of people out there for whom they could never ever put up with an automatic gearbox in a car like this. But um, trust me, don't knock it till you've tried it. This makes an awful lot of sense. I felt a very similar way about the Clio 200 EDC, though I know the purists will always deride it. The fact is, when you're having fun, it's still an engaging and exciting car, but when you're not, and you're not in the mood, just flip it into drive and it will do the gears for you, and it'll do a fairly good job, which makes it, to me, a good car. And for something like this, which is supposed to be year-round, everyday usable, that's important. So, there you have it, the Renault Sport Megane RS300 Sport. It is a very, very good car, and if you're on the hunt for a hot hatch, you've got to try one. Yeah.